Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Obviously, it is quite easy to respond to the question, what is your name? But how would you identify yourself? People want to know, who are you? Not by name, but some type of title, something that identifies yourself. Well, I can tell you what we should all strive for, and that is to be a servant of the Lord. And the psalm that we're going to study today and next week, Psalm 18, is a psalm that is directed to those who are servants of God. Take out your Bible and look there with me, the book of Psalms and Psalm 18. This psalm has a rather long inscription. That is that piece of scripture that frequently appears above the first verse. As I've said so many times in the study of Psalms, it is literally the first verse in the Hebrew text. So let's begin Psalm 18 and verse 1. It begins, which is to the chief music director, the one who is going to be responsible for leading others to recite this, to chant this, to use this psalm in worship. But notice it says to a servant of the Lord by David. This psalm is addressed specifically. It's written by David, but to a servant of the Lord. And what we should see here is that there are benefits from serving God. Obviously, benefits in the age to come in the kingdom of God, but also benefits now in this present age. And David is going to talk about some of those benefits that he personally experienced. Now, because he was a servant of God, David met opposition, great opposition. Let's keep reading in this first verse of the Hebrew text. It's by David to a servant of the Lord. And David wrote this down, these words he spoke to the Lord. It says, in writing this song, literally, which he spoke to the Lord, the words of this song. I think it's significant that we see that this psalm is also called a song. And one of the reasons for that is that it has a degree of worship, adoration, praise, thanksgiving. Frequently, a song is accompanied with joy. Not all songs, but frequently. This is a term of praise, singing to the Lord. That's what David's doing. It is also songs usually are to be shared, meaning that they want the author of them, the performer of them, wants individuals to hear this. There's a message to a song. So once more, to the chief musician, to a servant of the Lord by David, which he spoke to the Lord, so it's confessional, which he spoke to the Lord, the words of this song. In the day, and this is important, in the day that the Lord delivered or rescued him. First and foremost, as we get deeper and deeper into this psalm, we see that God rescues his people. We can have confidence that God if there's no response from him, 
If we do not experience deliverance, then it is his will for us to experience that momentary defeat. For example, the cross. The cross for the Son of God, Messiah Yeshua. It was a momentary defeat. He died. But nevertheless, we know that through that death came victory. People ask, and we'll see this in a few weeks, Psalm 22, when it speaks about, My Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken or abandoned me? That's how for a moment Yeshua himself felt as he hung upon that tree. But the deliverance did come through what? Through the resurrection. So we might experience a, a momentary setback, a defeat. We may not experience God's movement, but it's only a matter of time. And there is a great day of victory known in conjunction with resurrection. And as I've said many times, there's a connection between resurrection and the kingdom of God. Finally, in this verse, we see that God delivered David, it says, from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Shaul, King Saul. It's very important that we understand that David wrote this in light of the many years that he was on the run. When he was fleeing from Saul, now just think for a moment, Saul was the king, and for the vast degree of, of time, the soldiers, the armies of Israel was with Saul. They were under his authority. The vast majority were loyal to Shaul. David was greatly outnumbered. Yes, at times there were individuals with him, soldiers and such, but, but just a few. David experienced what it meant to have a great enemy, and we could say enemies in the plural, pursuing him. But this is what I like. We see that in the end, Shaul was put to death. He lost his life. David became king. And David is recounting that fact to us that God is faithful god is able to deliver and therefore he is worthy of our praise our thanksgiving in the midst of these trials and hardships these times of fear and loneliness well let's move on to the next verse verse 2 in the hebrew text and he said now most bibles in fact i checked over 20 translations, and all of them, all of them translated it the same way, where it says, he said, and this is David recounting, and they translate it, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Now, I would ask you to pay close attention to that word where it's translated. I will love you. One word in Hebrew, we have to translate it, I will love you, four words in English, but it's one word in Hebrew. And what's interesting is not the word for love or like or anything related to that. If you do a good study of this word, you will find that it's the basic word for being merciful. Now, here's the problem. I mean, is, is David saying to God, I will be merciful unto you. That doesn't make sense. Until you understand a little bit about the nature of mercy. Here again, this isn't the first time we, we discuss this, but the word mercy is in the plural. It's an abundant word, rachamim. And we have another noun from that word, but in the singular, not in the plural, rachamim, in the singular, rachem. It is womb, like a woman, the baby, her baby resides in the womb. And the nature of this word womb or mercy 
has to do with a selflessness. The womb functions for what's best for that baby. That's its objective, to provide the best. It is responsive to the baby's needs, the baby's situation. Mercy is when we see someone and we behave, not necessarily what they deserve, but we, and there's a relationship between mercy and grace, but we're gracious, we're merciful, we forgive, we do what's best for them. And what David is saying here, if we pay attention to literally what is being re re reviewed here, is that he says, not I will be merciful unto you in our way of, undef uh, our way of defining mercy, but what David is saying here is that he is responsive to God. He is saying, oh God, I am responsive to you. I do what is best according to you, what you have said, what you have commanded, what you have revealed to me. David is not making decisions in his own interest from his own perspective, but he's making decisions based upon what is right in God's eyes. That's what's being spoken of here. And when we do that, when we are responsive, our life reflects and is responsive to the instructions, the will, what God desires. Then what we can expect? Well, notice how this word, this verse concludes where it says, O Lord, his key, my strength. Here's the message for us. When an individual, doesn't matter who it is, once you have entered into a covenantal relationship with God, and obviously I'm talking about the new covenant through the gospel, you can be assured of something. When you are responsive to God according to his instructions, his will, his revelation, when you are behaving in that way, setting aside your own understanding, your own vantage point, doing what is right in his eyes, you are going to become a recipient of God's power, God's strength. He will strengthen you. That's what David is saying. And it's a strength that causes one to endure, persevere, and here's something else I like, to overcome. That's what David's revealing. Verse 3, here again. I'm going to give you the numbers in the Hebrew text. If you're following English, you'll need to take off one digit, one less. He says, O Lord, my rock, my fortress. And then it's a word for a place of deliverance or one who delivers. It's a different word. It comes from the same Hebrew word, which means a refugee. So it's one who is a refuge, one who is a deliverer, one who acts to rescue someone else. He says, my God, my rock, and it's a different word for rock. Earlier on in the same verse word begins, O Lord, my rock, it's the word sal-i. This is the word suri, my, my rock, and he says, I will trust in him. Meaning, I will, will take cover. I will find security in him. That's when we act in faithfulness, when we trust God and we move into obedience under his authority, we find shelter. That's what this phrase is referring to. He also is my shield. And then we have the term Karen Yishi. Karen is a horn, and it's a horn of my salvation. And the term Karen, horn, can also be an idiom for, for strength, power, authority. David is saying, you, O God, are my shield, the horn of my salvation, and misgavi, this is another word for, for a safe place, but what's unique in some of the English translations, get this right, it is a word that speaks of elevation. God taking one and putting him out of reach of the enemy, 
out of danger, lifting him up. And that's what David says. Now, an important characteristic of, of this verse is the first person singular possessive. What is that? My. Where he speaks about my strength, my God, my rock, my refuge, my fortress. So David is seeing God in a personal way that God is intimately involved in David's life. Secondly, as we press on, we see verse 4, Mehulal. Now, I realize that, that in order to help one understand this word, they oftentimes say, worthy to be praised. But it's simply the word to be praised. One who is praiseworthy. And David is addressing God as one who is praiseworthy. And what does he do? He says, and some Bibles do not put this in the right tense. It's in the Hebrew imperfect, which is the future, where it says, I will call unto the Lord. Why? Because God should always be the one that we turn to. And he's turning to him first and foremost, not because of, of his situation. He's turning to God because God is praiseworthy. So this idea, although it's not there intrinsically in the text, written out, but when we say worthy to be praised, that's in essence what, what is being expressed here. So David, he says, I will call of the Lord this one who's praiseworthy. And why? Well, first for who he is, but he says here as well, and from my enemies, it's in the plural, and from my enemies, enemies he says i will be saved so it's again a third word that speaks of deliverance being rescued being one who god acts as a a redeemer of that god acts in order to provide safety he's going to focus now in the activity of the enemies he says, they have surrounded me. What has? These uh, ropes of death. And this word, and we'll see it a couple times in this, this psalm, it can speak of ropes, cords, but it can also speak about, about pain and suffering. Now, if you look closely, we see something we see how he talks about the, the being surrounded by the cords of death. And then, now when I looked at the, the Hebrew commentary for this next word, they speak about it in a great number. But, but some of the English, I believe the King James, James speaks of floods. And it's literally the word for rivers, but multiple rivers in the plural. So it's as something is streaming in in a multiple way. And what is that? Well, we have a very unique word. It's the word. Bali ya'al. What is that? This is an expression that refers to some of the most evil individuals. Those who are wicked. Those who live in iniquity. Those who rejoice in the sufferings of others. And David is revealing here that these individuals, like a flood of water, many of them, these evil ones, are, are flooding in, and also they are fearful. That is, they bring fear. David is afraid. They cause him to be afraid. Literally, first person, they scare me. Then we have that same word where it speaks about the pains or the cords of, of death. Now we have a synonym. Instead of death, we have the term Sheol, the place of the dead. So these pains, these cords of death, of Sheol, it has another synonym. Instead of surrounding me, Afafuni, 
we have the word sevavuni. In essence, synonyms with the same idea of being wrapped around, being surrounded. And all of these cords of death, being surrounded of David, they all move him forward. Now, some of the Bibles, they translate this next word very interesting, very awkwardly, don't understand why, but it's the word kidmuni. Kidmu, lehit kadem, means to draw forward. I'm going forward. But here it's not in the hit palel, I'm doing it to myself, but rather it's being done to me. So they are causing me to go forward to where? To the snares of death. Here's what's being emphasized. David is under attack. There are numerous enemies. They have surrounded him, and he uses multiple words to speak about being surrounded, having the cords, the ropes of death shoal, pulling him and taking him forward in the direction of, that's the idea, there's progress to what? The snares of death. But what does David do in such a situation? Many people would give up, lose heart. But we have here, but Sir Lee, in my trouble, when there's trouble to me, he does the same thing. He says, I will call unto the Lord, unto my God. And he says again, I will, will cry out. So David, in the midst of this, doesn't get up, give up. He doesn't lose faith. He doesn't focus on, he's aware, he doesn't deny it. But he brings this situation, names it before God. Trusting God, believing God is going to respond. Now remember, I said to you a few minutes ago, David overcame this. Saul died, he descended into Sheol. David became king. God did in fact act in covenantal faithfulness to David. He called out, and we find in verse verse 7, the second part, verse 6 in English, it says, He heard my voice from his sanctuary. My cry before him came into his ears. And again, this idea of ears always speaks of intimacy. David is saying, it is because I have this covenantal relationship with God that I can be assured that God will hear. He will hear from his holy sanctuary my plea of, of help, my, my supplication, in other words, will go before him and come into his ears. And notice the next verse, verse 8 in Hebrew, 7 in English. There's quite a response. It's when we get to this verse that we see God acting in a mighty way. And I want to emphasize to us that we have indeed a mighty God, one that is capable. What does the scripture say? With him, all things are possible. Notice the language here. We have the earth will shake and make noise. David's one man. God's moving the earth, shaking it. And the noise of that can be heard. So he says the earth moves and makes noise. The foundation of literally the mountains. I know some Bibles will say hills. That would be Givot. But this is the word Harim. The foundations of the mountains. Also a different word. A synonym for shake. And then he says. Because of his anger. They all shake. Now what I like about this is. God is angry in David's behalf. David, as we're going to see, the next part of this psalm is going to, several verses, focus in on, and don't miss this, 
on the integrity of David, the spiritual integrity. David wants to be in righteousness. When was the last time you prayed, God, I want to walk righteously. I want to be in righteousness. I want everything that 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 comes forth for me to display your righteous standards. That's how we should behave. And in the same way that when we call unto God faith, we can expect God to respond. When we live in righteousness, doing that which is right in God's eyes and being a person who executes righteousness in our midst, it brings God mightily into our circumstances. And that's what we see in verse 8. God is angry at the enemies of David. Not only does the earth shake and make noise, Look at the next verse, verse 9 in the Hebrew text, verse 8 in English. Smoke goes up from, from his, his nose, and sometimes this word nose can mean his anger. And also from his mouth, fire will consume. So here we have smoke going up from his, his nose, And fire from his mouth is going to consume. And God, look at the next verse, or the end of verse 9, excuse me, where it says, And Gehalim, coals burn from him. God's anger, his indignation, is all depicted here as a fire, a consuming fire. Now, we know when there's a fire, more often than not, people die. One of the most dangerous things about fire is smoke. So we have smoke, we have fire itself, we have the coals all burning. And now look at verse 10, verse 9 in English. We have the word vayet. And this is a word when I was doing research, I wrote down... That the best way that we can understand it is moving something. God is moving something. And what is God moving? He's moving the heavens. God's action brings about a heavenly change in behalf of David. And then we have Vyared, which means he comes down. So the heavens move and he comes down. And we find that the, and it's a synonym, instead of, of ashan, smoke, we have the word arafel, which, which usually is fog, but not necessarily like a morning fog due to weather, but a, a different type of smoke. It's under his feet. God, look at the next verse. God is riding upon the ch- uh, cherub. He is flying. And then we have a synonym for the word flying, and the Hebrew scholars say that this means to fly at a great speed. And he does so upon the wings of the wind. Verse verse 12. Here, God is bringing more change. It says that he places darkness in his secret place. Around him, is his his dwelling place or canopy in one sense. The waters become dark and the clouds of the skies. So all of this is darkening. We see an emphasis here. If you look in this verse, verse 12 in the Hebrew, verse 11 in English, we see the word koshik, and then we see a covering that also makes things dark, a shade, and then the darkness of water, and then the clouds of the heaven. Everything's getting dark, but with a purpose. See, when things get dark, light is more visible. And the next thing we see, look at the next verse, verse 13 in Hebrew, verse 12 in English. It says, me no God. From a Noga. Noga 
is a Hebrew word which means an excessively bright and powerful light. So what's happening here is that God is, is darkening everything. And then in a moment, there is an abundant, powerful light that shines. From a bright light before him and clouds, they pass away. And then we have hail and coals of fire. Also, the Lord, he will make thunder in the heavens and the most high, he will give his voice. Now, everything that's happening and think of this, it's very similar to what we might see in a theater. Right before the, the main event, the play, the performance, the star comes out. What happens? They, they dim the lights in the theater. And then suddenly there's that spotlight on the center of attention. He's going to begin to do something. She's going to start her performance. And we're seeing that same type of imagery here. Things get dark, but in a moment, there is light, excessively powerful light, and then there's thundering, and we see that the clouds move away. And all of a sudden, to show his strength, there is hail and coals of fire. Thundering in the heavens for the Lord makes that thunder and the Lord and here it is the synonym for Hashem is the word Elyon the most high as in the most high God gives his voice again it says and hail and coals of fire verse 6 15 he sends his arrows and he scatters them and lightning and then we have the word rav, an abundant lightning, and they, they scare them. The lightning scares them. And appears, what appears? Channels of water. And it is revealed the foundations of the world. From the Lord's rebuke, and notice what it says, for he rebukes, the Lord rebukes you. And, and the blowing of the wind of, of uh, um, your, your nose. So God, the image here is that it's your rebuke, O Lord, that brings it about. And the blowing of wind from your, your nostrils, from your no nose. All of this is taking place. He will send from up on high. And he will take me. He will draw me. And this is the same word. That's why it's so important to see the biblical language. And to take your time as you go through. Because this word is the same word when it speaks about Moses being drawn up. He was in that basket in the Nile River. And he was taken up from the water. And this phrase to be taken up, remember if we go back to our, our verse where we read in verse 17 in Hebrew, verse 16 in English, he will take me. Well, the synonym here, remember parallelism, parallelism is he will draw me up, but it's the same word that the name Moses comes from. He will draw me up from many waters, verse 18. He will save me from my strong enemy and from the ones who hate me because they are stronger than me. And again, the verse that comes into my mind is this, that the one in us is stronger than the one in this world. We do not have reason to be afraid. Doesn't matter who the enemy is. Doesn't matter how many are with him. Our God is greater.
And we have a source of deliverance. And what is that? That new covenant relationship. But I mentioned a little while ago that David, what was he passionate about? Well, I got ahead of myself. I talked about righteousness. How important righteousness is. And we're going to see this as we begin to conclude the first half of this psalm. Notice that righteousness is going to play a role. Look now to, to verse 19 in the Hebrew 18 in English. It's once more this word for moving forward, going forth. It says, and they will propel me in the day of my trouble. That's what the enemy does. But the Lord, he will be for Mish'an Li. Now, the word Mish'an is a place that you can lean upon. So, so God is a source of support from us. That's what it's saying. The enemy, they are pushing me forward to the day of my trouble. And what does David do? He says, but God, you have become for me a place of leaning. What the scriptures teach us is that God is always available for us to lean upon him. He is a great source of, of support. And what will he do? Verse 20. And he will bring me forth to a wide place. Now, in Hebrew, the word rachav, wide, broad, we have the idea of affliction and stress being pressed together. Anxiety, this affliction, pressure. But the opposite of that, that is the Hebrew word narrow. So even though the words narrow, tsar, we find that it conveys pressure, grief, stress, anxiety. And the word rachav, broad, expresses just the opposite. Cover, relief, safety, deliverance. So the text is telling us that God brings us forth to, or in this case, David, it's personal about him, it's his psalm. David says, God, you bring me forth to a broad place, a place of comfort, a place of deliverance. And by the way, this word for bringing out is connected to the thought of redemption. And then the next part of verse 20, verse 19 in English, Yechal Seni. This is the same word I've mentioned it in our other studies, where we can get a word for a court screw. Now, we know when we put a corkscrew in a, a bottle and we pull out that cork, there's a release. There's pressure there. That cork is holding it in, that pressure. But when we take it out, oftentimes the beverage bubbles up or it sprays forth all of that, that pressure. And this is what David is saying, that he is a, God is a source of release for him. And why do, does God release him, deliver him? It says, for he has delighted in me. Now, of all the verses that we have studied thus far, I would take a highlighter, take a pen, and I would, would underscore, underline, highlight those three words in the Hebrew text where it says in English, Ki chafetz be for he delights in me. Now, this word chafetz, a weaker word is the word ratzon. Ratzon is want. But chafetz is want, but a more intense. Now, just think of this. David is saying, God, you delight in me. Can you say that prayerfully? God, I have confidence. I have assurance that you delight in me. Probably you can't. 
So the question that we have to, to answer for ourselves, because I can't either, what will bring about a change in me that will cause God to delight in me? That's what we're going to focus in on as we begin to wrap up. Look, if you would, to verse 21, verse 20 in English. Now we see that several times this concept that I've mentioned twice, this concept of righteousness appears. David is speaking and he says, because I have kept the ways of the Lord. Read that again. David understands that God delights in him because David has done something. David has kept the ways of the Lord. And he says, and not, and it's a verb for wicked. Now, we would have to say, I have not behaved wickedly. And then we have a preposition, the preposition men. Now, the noon sophit falls out and it's attached to the next word. And that's why you only have one letter, the letter men. But it means from. And here again, there's a principle that's being taught here. See, when I behave wickedly, when anyone does that which is displeasing to God, it's because we moved, and here's the key, from God, out of his ways. So wickedness is always an outcome of us moving away from God. The question we should ask, what's the outcome when I move towards God? I walk with God. Well, that's what he's going to tell us. Now look with me to verse 21, verse 20 in the English. It says here, and here's this term righteousness that I've spoken of. And the Lord, he will, and this is a word for payback, recompense. It involves a payment in return of something. And David is confident. He says here, the Lord will recompense me according to my righteousness. See, righteousness should be important to us. Behaving in a way that fulfills the expectations and, and don't miss this, the commandments of God. And then he says, as the purity of my hands, and he's saying here, as my pure hand is, so also he will return unto me. So we see in this passage, this verse, the relationship between righteousness and purity. When you are committed to the righteous judgments of God, his standards, his judgments, then it is going to produce a purity in behavior. Very important biblical truth. Verse 23, verse 22 in English. Because all of your, excuse me, all of his judgments is before me. David is speaking, he says, God, all of your judgments, and in this case, judgments, has to do with, with decisions. David is saying, what you have decided as right, your judgments are before me. I make them my own. I put them before me. And your, or simply, his statutes. David is speaking to God and he says, And his statutes I do not or I will not remove from me. Now, what's the takeaway for us? Well, if we want to keep the ways of the Lord, if we don't want to do evil, then what do we do? We have to keep the judgments of God before us and his statutes do not, he says, I will not take away from me. And therefore, when he does this, what can he say? Well, he can say here in this passage, verse 24, and I will, literally, I have been tamim. Tamim is innocent, blameless. It's a word of perfection because one have trusted, relied, dependent upon God. 
You depend upon God and there's going to be a great outcome. So David says, verse 24, I have been innocent. Here's the key with him. David is saying, I have been blameless with him. And then he talks about how. And I have kept myself from iniquity. When you're with him, relying, depending upon him, then you are going to be, what does he say? You are going to keep yourself from iniquity. Verse 25. The Lord, he has returned me, he has returned to me as, and here's the key, my righteousness. Now, I've been talking a lot about it, but finally we arrive at the text. David, he is living righteously. David is behaving, trusting, depending upon God so that he can do God's statutes, God's ways, his judgments, so that he manifests righteousness. And therefore, this benefit of deliverance is coming to him. Why? Because the Lord is returning to me according to my righteousness. And then he says, as the purity of my hand, and realize that hand is related to, hand is related to deeds. Whatever my hand finds, it'll be done. So he's talking here, end of our study for this, this section. He says, according to the purity of my hands, he says, which are before his eyes. So David, there's nothing concealed. David is praying this with confidence because he knows that he has walked in the ways of God, that he has not behaved wickedly, that he has put God's judgments, God's decisions, God's ways, his statutes before him so he would not turn aside from what God has said is right. And in doing that, David knows this brings about God's desire for me. And that desire for David is going to produce deliverance. And God's activity in David's life is going to be, don't miss this, according to David's righteousness. And that's why it's so important that you and I strive for righteousness. And here's the last thing I'm going to say before we conclude, and that's this. The grace of God just doesn't cause God to impute his righteousness to us. That is a great benefit. That gives us assurance. I've spoken about that in the recent days and other teachings. My iniquity was placed upon Messiah. His righteousness was imputed, given to me. That is a declarative righteousness that allows us to enter into the kingdom of God. But there's not just this declarative righteousness through God's grace, but God's grace works in our life to produce righteous behavior. And that's what David is talking about here. And if we're not committed to righteous behavior, doing that which is just, proper in the eyes of God, then grace isn't working in our life. And if grace isn't working in our life, then perhaps the reason for that is we have not received the biblical grace. True biblical grace declares us to be righteous by the mercy of God through the blood of Messiah, but that same grace has a different and additional purpose, and that is to produce the righteousness of God through our behaviors. Well, we'll continue the second half of Psalm 18 next week as we study this wonderful psalm of giving thanks for our God, who indeed is our deliverer. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. 
Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.